good morning and welcome to this landmark webinar on injunctions relating to protests and uh, travellers. Uh, I'm Dave Forsyth and I'm going to be chairing this um, seminar which is going to last for about an hour and a quarter. A bit, a bit of housekeeping before we start if I may. Uh, first of all, um, you should all automatically be on mute and we'd appreciate it if you stayed on mute um, for obvious reasons. We've, would uh, any questions that arise during the course of the discussion, please put on the chat function on the bottom and I'll try to raise those questions with the speakers uh, towards the end of the seminar. You're also, I think, all your videos will be automatically disabled and uh, please um, keep it like that if you wouldn't mind. Um, a, a recording of this webinar and the slideshows will be available on the uh, Chamber's website this afternoon, uh, so if you um, can't stay for the whole duration, uh, then you'll be able to catch up with what you miss um, there. I, I first became aware of the awesome power of injunctions when as a student union sabbatical um, at Warwick University, I was involved in a protest occupation um, and was promptly served with a High Court order in the case of Warwick University versus Forsdick. It was rather that um, rather terrifying first brush with the law uh, that excited my interest in becoming a barrister. And certainly over the first few years of being a barrister, I did a lot of injunctions for universities and for students defending those injunctions. But those were all pretty standard injunctions where there was an obvious trespass, there was an obvious, obviously identifiable defendant, there was no defence, and you could get those injunctions in a matter of minutes over the phone to the um, High Court judge sitting in chambers. But what about the much more complex situations where there's hundreds of protesters, where there's long-term encampments, where the protesters, their names and identities are unknown, when the protests are ongoing for the long term, and even when there's no trespass and the uh, protest is happening out on the public highway? How does the law deal with all of those? It wasn't until about 2003 that Catherine Holland, who's now at Landmark Chambers, um, secured the first ever um, protest injunction against persons unknown. In the next many years, there was a small trickle of such cases, the high point of which was probably the St Paul's Occupy protest in 2012. You'll recall there was a, a huge occupation outside St Paul's Cathedral that lasted for many months. Uh, with hundreds of people um, uh, camping outside St Paul's and the question in that case was how to get an injunction against persons uh, unknown. As those injunctions became more the norm, uh, a number of injunctions were then sought and secured against urban explorers, who, um, people who like climbing buildings like the Shard or Old Trafford or the Emirates Stadium. Uh, and they became rather uh, standard injunctions, queer timid injunctions, to preclude um, such trespasses. But in all those cases, a, a high legal hurdle was set and a high burden of proof was applied. Uh, and those of us seeking the injunctions uh, had to be exceptionally careful to make sure we went through all the correct procedural hoops in order to make sure that the right people were named, the right people were served, the right processes had got, been gone through, and that everyone had had a chance to, to put in any defence they wanted to. Unfortunately, what then happened was a bit of a bandwagon was created in which uh, injunctions somehow came to be seen as the easy option, the easy way to prevent inconvenient protests, including uh, uh, entirely lawful protests. Uh, and in some of the later cases, some of the claimants became a bit blasé. I should, should stress that the claimants were not represented by anybody from Landmark. Um, but people became a bit blasé about things like the burden of proof, or about the procedures, or about the role of injunctions, or about the importance of the right to roam for travellers, and the uh, fundamental importance of the right to protest in a democracy. And we then ended up last year with some applications for injunctions that seemed to me, as an outsider, completely inappropriate. Uh, use of the injunction power in circumstances for which the injunction power was never designed, using completely inappropriate procedures. Uh, and unsurprisingly, we ended up with a situation where the courts um, bit back. Um, and there's been a number of cases over the last couple of years where the courts have really um, strengthened their supervisory jurisdiction to make sure that the injunction uh, are not uh, granted too easily. 
Tim Bewley QC and Yasser Vanderman are going to take us through those cases on the right to protest and how to avoid the obvious pitfalls that many people have recently fallen into. Tim's going to focus uh, on the substantive issues and Yasser on the procedural aspects. Uh, Tim and uh, Yasser were both involved in the Sheffield Trees um, uh, protest injunctions, which I think is still uh, ongoing. Uh, and they have wide ranging experience of, junk, uh, of seeking injunctions for local authorities and landowners. About 10 years ago, the Supreme Court in Maya opened the door to borough wide injunctions against uh, uh, trespass uh, by travellers. Uh, those were then rolled out by many local authorities, with Richard Langham from Landmark acting for them. Uh, and he um, secured a large number of such uh, wide ranging injunctions by carefully recognising the limitations of such uh, injunctions uh, and the procedural steps that have to be gone through. He's going to be telling us about the Bromley case, uh, where the borough-wide injunctions have come up against a bit of a brick wall. The proposals, uh, sorry, the government has proposals to extend police powers uh, in relation to unauthorised encampments. Matthew Fraser is going to be explaining the proposals and how they fit into the overall framework uh, regulating such activities. He's had significant experience in relation to protest injunctions, including recent injunctions relating to uh, the Extinction Rebellion uh, protests. And he's currently advising uh, local authorities on the implications of Bromley. Uh, through all these talks, I hope you're going to see a repeated theme namely that interim injunctions against imminent threatened wrongs by identifiable individuals are still fine. You can still get those pretty easily. In fact, I got one a few days ago in no time. Uh, however, wide ranging final injunctions for the long term against persons unknown are now severely curtailed. The talks will emphasize, I hope, the importance of uh, getting the procedures right the defendant's right, the service right, and the ambit of the injunctions as limited as possible to achieve the desired objective. In other words, as long as you approach injunctions on the basis that they're oppressive and exceptional uh, and have to be fully and carefully justified, you're likely to be okay. If you treat them as a slam dunk that you're going to get automatically, uh, then not. If landowners approach, uh, adopt that approach, uh, then certainly in my experience recently, you still get uh, the injunctions you seek. Uh, but for, if you're acting for a defendant uh, against such injunctions, keeping an eye on procedural failings by claimants is often a recipe to successfully resisting an injunction or even uh, successfully resisting contempt proceedings further down the line. With that short introduction, I'm going to hand over to Tim, who's going to talk on the substantive uh, issues in relation to protest injunctions. Thank you very much, David. So, uh, 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 as David says, um, Yasser and I uh, are going to be speaking under the general topic of injunctions against protesters, but I'm going to be dealing, this is a two-part session, it's slightly longer than the other sessions, I'm going to be dealing with um, the, the part one, which is the substantive issues, and then Yasser will deal with the, not, the knotty procedural issues that, uh, David, uh, that, that have arisen in the last few years. Um, my talk is more by way of a general overview of the, the substantive law. It's, it's actually, and David's just reflected on this, it's in relation to the procedural issues that we've seen some of the most interesting changes over the last few years, uh, although I will touch on those as well. Uh, okay, so basic position, forgive me, I'm just trying to make sure I've got, hey, there we go. It's a bit of a delay when I change the screen. Right, uh, basic position, there is of course no freestanding right to seek an injunction as such. The law doesn't recognise an application for an injunction or an injunction against protesters uh, as a cause of action. And so what you first must do is uh, demonstrate some underlying cause of action normally in civil law, in domestic civil law. And the position was explained by Professor Dicey, who was a great writer on the constitution in the middle of the 20th century, in his introduction to the study of the law of the constitution, reflecting his wider themes about his wider thesis about the nature of civil liberties in, in, in Britain, in the UK. Um, and as he said, I won't read out the whole of this passage, but it was quoted in a recent case. 
There is no special law allowing A, B and C to meet together either in the open air or elsewhere for a lawful purpose. But the right of A to go where he pleases so that he does not commit a trespass and to say what he likes to be so that his talk is not libelous or seditious, uh, the right of B to do the like and so on, lead to the consequence that A, B, C and D and a thousand or ten thousand other persons may, as a general rule, meet together in any place where otherwise they each have a right to be for a lawful purpose and in a lawful matter. manner. So what you have to show if you want to restrain the activity of a protester is, is that they are in some way breaching some aspect of the general law. Uh, and subject to the uh, role that the European Convention on Human Rights plays in this field, uh, which I'll touch on, uh, that, remains, that remains English and Welsh, and I suppose also, although I confess I'm not an expert, also Scottish law. Uh, and that was what Lord Justice Longmore said recently in the Ineos, Ineos upstream case, which is, what is one of the cases about protesters against fracking activities. Um, with that thought in mind, we do, I just want to think about what the causes of action uh, might be in a moment, but a, a critical element that's going to be important to that is who the nature of the claimant for the injunction is. And in broad terms, um, we have seen two, uh, you, there are going to be two kinds of uh, possible claimant, and the cases over the last four or five years probably represent, ru divide roughly 50-50 between those. So first of all, you may have a public body claimant, obviously a local authority, the City of London in relation to the St Paul's protests that David was talking about, Birmingham City Council in the ASFAR case dealing with protests against um, the teaching of LGBT uh, issues in, in a local school, that sort of situation. And alternatively, you may simply have private bodies such as fracking companies, highways contractors, my client in the, in the Sheffield Trees matter, um, something of that kind. Now, it's really important at the outset to think about which of those you're dealing with because public bodies, as we'll see in just a moment, are going to have a much wider range of remedies available to them than uh, private bodies generally will do uh, because they have standing to enforce or impose legal restraints in a way that private bodies just don't do. But with that in mind then, what are the likely causes of action? Well, there's no a priori limitation on this. It could be it could be a, if you can identify some way in which a protester is breaching the law then then that may pr provide your cause of action but the obvious examples and often a sufficient uh, are going to be first of all and the ones that are routinely relied upon first of all trespass to land that's going to be the most straightforward because a landowner ordinarily has the power to restrict the access uh, of, of uh, people to his land and secondly slightly more slightly less straightforwardly nuisance. Now trespass to land will often be a sufficient cause of action for a public body and so it, for example in the Farrell case which I've given on the side that's the Sheffield Trees case although the council represented ably by David who you've just heard from um, brought, brought its claim on the basis of a number of different causes of action uh, it was sufficient to its case that it could rely on trespass because it was dealing with the highway and the critical point about trespass for a public authority is that it will encompass or likely to encompass unlawful intrusion onto the highway and a public body or the right public body will have the standing to enforce that. Nuisance is the other one that's routinely relied upon. Where is that going to be important? Well that's going to be important perhaps certainly to public bodies who may want to rely on nuisance in the alternative but also potentially to private bodies. So just think about for example the fracking cases, the Ineos case and the Quadrilla case. The, the citations for these are on the slides so, um, uh, later on. Um, in the Ineos, in, in those cases, um, the private bodies were to some extent able to rely on trespass insofar as people were going onto their own land, onto their own privately owned land. But they also often were dealing with issues around people on the public highway who were impeding their use of the public highway, their access to the public highway, matters of that kind. Now in a case where the public body who have standing in relation to trespass is not willing to take, take action, uh, a, a private body that may therefore need to rely on uh, nuisance. More briefly, I'll just touch on these. Other causes of action that have come up in, in recent years have been economic torts, conspiracy to injure by unlawful means and unlawful interference with business. 
I won't go into the detail of those now. We can have some questions about them if people want to. But the point about that is that they may be particularly relevant to private claimants who are not able to point directly to breaches of the law against which they can enforce in terms of trespass and nuisance. And, and what they effectively point to is unlawful action, uh, action which is unlawful, for example, because it constitutes a trespass against someone else, which causes them economic harm and they can therefore, it's called, the, the phrase used in the cases is liability stretching. They may be able to um, put forward a, case, a cause of action via that route. So the basic idea is you need to demonstrate, as I said, that the uh, action of the uh, trespassers, uh, sorry, the action of the protesters is unlawful pursuant to one of these means. Um, but then, of course, critically important is going to be now the European Convention on Human Rights, um, which uh, uh, overlays all of this and is going to significantly affect the way, first of all, that the, the courts in, uh, interpret the law, but also the way in which the courts are willing to grant inj injunctions in particular cases. Now, in th in potentially uh, in play, you'll have articles 9, 10 and 11. So freedom of religion and thought, freedom of expression and freedom of assembly. But for most purposes, not going to you're not going to get very much out of distinguishing between them. The most obviously relevant or the most obviously appropriate one seems to be Article 11, because that's about assembly, uh, and so I set out that. And I, I won't read out Article 11 here, but it, there's, as with most convention rights, it involves two stages. The first question you, you need to ask is whether the article engaged, is engaged. So everyone has the right to freedom of pe peaceful assembly and to freedom of association. The basic right is you can do it, you can express yourself freely under Article 10, you can assemble freely under Article 11 and so on. But secondly, the article recognises that a public body can then impose restrictions and limitations on those rights subject to the caveats provided for in Article 2 and that's generally put under the heading of justification. So in all cases you need to consider that two-stage analysis. Um, first question then in a protester case is going to be, well, is Article 11 or it may be Article 9 or Article 10 engaged. Um, and obvi obviously Article 11 is generally going to be engaged in cases of protest, but there has been a controversy uh, over the last uh, few years, although largely resolved now, or probably now completely resolved by the Quadrilla case, about the extent to which Article 11 applies to unlawful protests. In other words, if what protesters are doing is not, is, is perhaps not peaceful, but in particular is in breach of the civil law. They're interfering with other people's rights, for example, to use the highway. Does Article 11 cover that? Um, but that, that issue was considered in a number of cases in Samedi uh, and in Fairhall, where uh, it was held that, that, certainly on the facts of those cases, the fact that the protests were in principle unlawful didn't prevent the engagement of the Article 11. And I think now that the Quadrilla case decisively resolves that in no situation, the, the, the fact that a protest is not lawful in any respect doesn't in itself prevent the engagement of, of Article 11. What that means then is that in every case you're going to need to look at, um, to look at the next stage, which is the justification stage. Um, so, in other words, can the public authority justify some interference with the uh, right of protest? Now, uh, that will be fact sensitive. You're going to need to look at a wide range of factors in considering that. We'll look at what they are in a minute. But there is a critical starting point, which was established by Lord Newberger in the Samedi case. And in terms of subject to the procedural issues about whether you can identify the right defendant or any defendant, um, this puts those seeking injunctions in a relatively strong position. Uh, so Lord, Lord Newberger and Samedi, the, the essential point in an earlier case, the Hall case, is that whilst the protesters' Article 11, 10 and 11 rights are undoubtedly engaged, it is very difficult to see how they could ever prevail against the will of the landowner when they are continuously and exclusively occupying public land, breaching not just the owner's property rights and certain statutory provisions, but sig significantly interfering with the public and convention rights of others. And in the fair old case, Mr. Justice Mayer put a, a bit of a gloss on that and said in effectively that therefore, effect, said effectively that the starting point is going to be that if what you're doing is breaching the law, that's going to be a very powerful factor in terms of justification. Now that doesn't make the European Convention a dead letter uh, for two reasons, I think. For, first of all, because the Convention has 
tended to influence the way in which the courts have approached generally domestic law. And some of the points that David has reflected on, and we'll hear a bit more about from Yasser in a moment, are, I think, influenced by the fact that the court is conscious that it's dealing with, as David said, the fundamental right of process. Secondly, it's one thing to say you can justify an injunction in general. It's going to be a different question to think about, well, what is the, what is the detail of that injunction and how far should the courts go? And, and issues of, hard issues of justification may come in there. What then are the relevant factors? Well, the, the first one I've just reflected on, whether the breach, whether there's a breach of domestic, civil and or criminal law. And of course, just pausing on that, if you think about how that relates to what I said at the outset, by definition, in a case where you've got a prima facie right to an injunction, you have, you have already established, you have to have established that there's some breach of uh, domestic civil or criminal law because there isn't, the way, our, the way English law works is there's no right to seek an injunction, no ability to restrain the protest in the first place. So by definition, albeit context will vary, this is going to be a factor that's in play in terms of uh, justification for an injunction. What else will be important? Well, obviously, I, th I think they're common sense in a way, but first of all, the extent of the interference with the rights of the claimant, that's the person seeking the injunction, remember, in this context. Uh, in, in a private law case, that's going to be the extent to which their ability to use their land or carry out lawful activities is impinged. For a public body, um, it, it's also going to be important, this was a really significant factor in the Farrell case, for example, to, to, to look at the extent to which uh, there's an interference with their ability to carry out their public functions. It's not the local authority's private um, private rights per se that matter. It's the fact that in the, in the Feral case, that's the Sheffield Trees case, the local authority was seeking to carry out, it, carry out, carry out its duties to improve the highway, uh, and it was being uh, that was a task mandated by statute uh, and it carried out pursuant to a democratic mandate, and its ability to carry out that function was impinged. Then, obviously, in, to the extent that you've got, especially a pu public body claiming the extent of interference with rights of others. So in the St Paul's protest, it was very important that the protesters were preventing other members of the public using the highway and going about their business and so on. Um, the location of the protest and the length of the protest. What is not relevant, the courts have generally said, um, is the content of the protest. In other words, the courts aren't concerned with the merits of what the protesters are saying in general. Indeed, that would, to, to take account of that, would um, be contrary to the whole idea of free, free assembly and free speech. Um, having said that, it is interesting to note that, for example, in the Assar case, and the Assar case is a very, re very recent case about. Um, people carrying out protests outside of school about the um, teaching of LGBT uh, content in schools. It's pretty clear that the judge was quite influenced, not by the fact that, not by the fact that people were opposed to LGBT rights per se, but that the protest, protesters were saying things about what was being done, which was simply untruthful. They were, they were, it looked like they were greatly exaggerating the, the nature of what was being taught so that they were accused of, for example, teaching that sisters as opposed to two people of the same sex could um, have sexual relationships and that simply wasn't true. And the judge does seem to have been somewhat influenced by that. Um, whether he should have been is a different matter. Uh, last point for me, this is a relatively new point in the case law, is the role of section 12.3 of the Human Rights Act 1998. Now this is relevant not to final but to interim injunctions and um, section 12, it's slightly counterintuitive, section 12.1 of the 1998 Act uh, applies where a court is considering whether to grant relief which might affect the exercise of the right to freedom of expression. So that's article 10 not article 11 but in practice most protests are going to engage article 10, perhaps all protests are going to engage article 10. And then you have the slightly counterintuitive wording of for our context, because it's not what it was originally aimed at probably, of subsection three, no such relief, that's to say injunctive relief, is to be granted so as to restrain publication before trial. Now that looks like it's concerned with publication by newspapers and there's no doubt that that's the reason that found its way into the Act. Uh, but anyway, 
restrain publication before trial unless the court is satisfied the applicant is likely to establish that the publication should not be allowed. In other words, unless they're likely to succeed ultimately at, at trial. And the courts accepted, Mr. Justice Morgan in the INEOS case, accepted that that would apply to um, a case, effectively a publication will, will occur when people are protesting uh, because they're publishing their views uh, and therefore that was applicable. But he nevertheless granted the injunction in the INEOS case and the Court of Appeal was critical of that. Um, he, the Court of Appeal held that he had failed to apply it properly um, because it wasn't, what, what, the, what he had said was, if the evidence of the claimants is accepted, I think it's likely that um, an injunction would be granted. And the claimant, the, sorry, the, the appellants, the, pro, the defendants in the lower court, said, well, hold on, that's not applying Section 12.3 properly. It's not on the hypothesis that our evidence is accepted, you, 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 um, would you grant an injunction? It's, is it likely you will succeed in all of the circumstances? And so if there's a dispute about the facts, that's something you've got to take into account at the interim stage. In considering whether uh, the injunctive relief will be uh, granted. That's going to be a really significant obstacle, it seems to me, in the way of getting interim relief in these cases, in situations to where it applies. Probably, po quite po possibly not in the simple trespasser case. So if you've got protesters going onto land uh, that, is, that they have a right to be on, certainly private land, private claimant may be able to establish that that's obviously a trespass, it's obviously unlawful, uh, and there's not likely to be much of a defence. Um, but in more complicated cases, it does mean that you're likely to be looking at, uh, it's, it's going to be much harder to get your interim relief, and you may need to go effectively for an expedited final hearing. Um, just a final thought then before I hand over to Yasser. Um, one, of, one of the recent cases that Yasser is going to be talking about, it, it, I suspect in rather more detail, is the uh, Canada Goose case, and that has important procedural consequences. But I thought it was interesting to see what the court said at, towards the end of its judgment about the position of Canada Goose. So Canada Goose is a company who sell um, uh, uh, coats and other products which uh, contain animal fur and down. That's been the source of lots of protests. It sought to obtain pretty wide-ranging injunctions to prevent that, and it was not successful. In paragraph 93 of the judgment, the Court of Appeal says that Canada Goose's problem is that it seeks to invoke the civil jurisdiction of the courts as a means of permanently controlling ongoing public demonstrations by a continuing, continually, continually fluctuating body of protesters. And that's the point, which I think refl was reflected in what David said as well, that the courts have really been pushed back on, this very wide-ranging injunction of that kind. But that's led not so much to changes in the substantive law that I've been talking about, but to changes in the way that the courts are willing to, grant, to look at the procedural issues that YAS is going to be touching on. What the court goes on to say is that the appropriate remedy, therefore, may be not this use of the courts to obtain injunctions in these kind of cases, but the wider powers sometimes given to public authority, for example, public space protection orders. And it may be interesting to see whether um, that sort of that sort of action by public bodies is is going to be looked at in the alternative in, in the light of the problems that Yasser will be now turning to. Thanks very much. I'll flick on, and hopefully someone's going to give Yasser control of the screen. And you can, I shall mute, mute myself. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm, as you might say, I'm currently at the stage where I'm probably having my second lockdown haircut, but I don't necessarily want to brave my wife's scissor work for a second try if I can get away with it, which is basically my way of explaining, if not justifying, my un unkempt hair at the moment. Protest. Something's happened over the last few years, resulting in an absolute explosion of protest, something in the political environment, I suppose meaning that you know, I've been involved in the Sheffield Tree protest case that Dave was talking about, Goldsmith College protest last year, protests relating to energy companies, security companies, park authorities. So it really has exploded and um, found every aspect of, of, of our environment. I'll be talking about the procedural aspect, getting to court. Um, and we thought it'd be useful for me to go after Tim, but Tim shows you where you need to end up and I can show you how to get there, hopefully. Unless that you think this is the boring and inconsequential 
part of the talk, please think again. The procedure involved in this specific type of proceeding, truncheons against protesters, is perhaps procedurally uh, the most fraught I've come across. If you don't cross, dot every I, cross every T, the court will come down and you like a ton of bricks. And so I cannot stress how seriously enough, uh, how seriously you should be taking the get into court phase. Um, so what will I be talking about? These are the main things I intend to talk about, four issues. Um, first question is whether you should be notifying the other side. You decided you want to get an injunction. Whether you should be notifying the other side before the first hearing. Second is the really fundamental issue of persons unknown. Third is what are the service requirements in order to start the process. And finally, what should your draft order look like? In other words, what, what should you be actually trying to injunct? Looking first at whether you should be going without notice. The short answer is, is, is probably not, almost certainly not in a protest case. Now you may, uh, I'll just flesh that out in some detail. You may, um, Tim talked about the Birmingham case, very high profile. Um, protests by parents of children being taught things in sex education classes about LGBT etc. So the school wanted to injunct the parents who had formed a, a zone outside the school and causing a bit of chaos. Lots of issues with the claim and one of them was that the interim injunction was granted ex parte, i.e. the council went along and didn't notify the other side and had a hearing without the other side being there. Mr Justice Warby said um, well, and the argument was that if the protesters had found out about the hearing, the claim, the injunction, the protest would have escalated. And um, Mr Justice Warby said basically said that wasn't good enough. As a matter of fact, he found that it probably wouldn't have escalated because it was half term and so people were on holiday. Um, but in any event, he stressed the exceptional nature of a without notice hearing, and it's particularly in the context of Article 10, 11, um, Freedom of Assembly. Now the question you have to ask, if you're just thinking about it, is whether if the respondents were given notice, if the protesters were given notice, would, um, is there a risk that their steps would be taken to defeat the purpose of the application? Now in other contexts, freezing injunctions, where you're scared someone might transfer money abroad and you never see it again, or where you're being blackmailed and you're concerned that the information will be revealed, and that process is obviously irreversible, and without notice hearing makes sense. Uh, the respondent might take steps to defeat the purpose of the application, which is to prevent those things from happening. It's much more difficult to envisage that happening in a protest situation um, where mere escalation, as in the Birmingham case, is simply not enough. It's not enough that there will be more protesters, you can still get the injunction. So, in a protest context, start with the premise that notice will have to be given to the other side before you, um, before you go for it, and obviously that will have timing implications if what you're trying to do is very urgent. But I mean, I'm not going to go through any detail because, as I said, I don't think it will happen very frequently in the protest case. But uh, you'll have to say, give evidence why no notice is being given. There's duty for and frank disclosure, which are very onerous, and duty to make a note of the hearing and serve it on the other side without delay. But I'm not going to go through that in much detail. Moving on to persons unknown, and this really is a cutting edge area of the law at the moment. I said, I mean, and just to give you a very brief background, as well as going against named defendants, which you would normally do in a claim, you can also go after persons unknown, obviously relevant and important in a protest context, because you may not know who the protesters are. They may take deliberate steps to conceal their identity, wear masks. There may be a never ending flow of protesters willing to take the place of people who were there originally. Um, so that's why you need it. And of course, understandably, aren't huge fans of letting you go against persons unknown because there is a tension between the fundamental principle that defendants are identified and named and play a full part in proceedings and the fact that if you can't go against persons unknown um, your justice may be stymied. So those are the main cases. Three courts of appeal, the first three, the last one is a high court of authority that have fundamentally transformed the position in this area such that even if you were completely up to date a year ago with the law, you would now be out of date because of these cases. And I recommend that you read basically all of them and perhaps including some of the first instance decisions. The first two involve fracking companies. Um, in any of the, the disrupt the protest hadn't yet occurred in the Quadrilla case it had. Um, in the Canada Goose case that involved, as 
same said protests outside the kind of blue shop in Regent Street um, and in the Afzal case, as I've already said, this is, there, there are a number of Afzal judgments. This is the most recent one, just last month, which was dealing with persons unknown. For some reason, that specific part was dealt with on the papers after the main trial had taken place. It's important essentially because it applies to previous courts of appeal authority. So the general principles, um, and I'm going to say, rather than go through the twists and turns of each case, and it has been a bit of a roller coaster ride, I'm just going to give you where we've got to at the moment. I think it's much more useful. So we see there's no issue with going against persons unknown in the protest concept, concept um, context, even if it's a, before anything, any protests have happened. That, that argument would run in INEOS, the first of the court of appeal cases, the claimants just shouldn't in principle be able to go against persons unknown. That was rejected. But the quid pro quo is that it has to be impossible to, take, to name the persons um, that you want to go against. It has to be impossible. And in AFSAR, Mr. Justice Warby said, also impracticable, which you can see also makes sense. And I think in reality, that means that you have to do whatever you can to try and identify them. And in previous cases, that includes going on Facebook, on social media. Um, in the AFSAR case, you have parents who presumably wouldn't be that hard to try and identify, but weren't in that case. And also it has to be possible to give them notice of the injunction. And that won't be too hard because often it will just be at a prominent place where the protest is taking place. Um, who does it include? Two groups of people. One is anonymous defendants who are identified at the time that you commence proceedings, but you simply just don't know their name. So you maybe know what they look like. You, you can identify them, but you just don't know what their name is and you have no way of naming them. And the second is people who, uh, in the future, who haven't yet joined the protest, but might in the future join the protest and thereby fall into the description of persons unknown. So those are, those are your targets, um, if you're a claimant. Um, now the first hurdle you face is, well, how do you describe persons unknown in the originating process? So in the claim form, in the draft order, the particulars, how do you describe them in the header? Um, you've got to describe them so as to cover the conduct that you want injuncted. As with the wording in the draft order, there is a tension for the claimant between wanting to cover as much activity, activity as possible to deter that behaviour, but also recognising what the court is going to let you get away with. And that window has narrowed in the last year or two. So you cannot just say persons unknown, unlike in certain statutory proceedings, like possession proceedings, where you can go against just persons unknown. In this context, you cannot go against persons unknown, um, just that phrase. That's what happened in AFSAR and that was criticised. Similarly, in Canada Goose, your definition cannot be impermissibly wide. If you read that description, you will see that it doesn't, it doesn't define people by their geographical location. So one criticism was that, that Mr. Justice Nicklin made in the first instance case in Canada Goose and repeated in the Court of Appeal was that could apply to a protester in Penzance, as long as they are protesters, that they protest against the manufacturer of the Canada Goose where. So that's too wide, have to be more geographically specific. <clears throat> What was acceptable was the last example that was using quadrilla. So you can see how specific that has to be. It's got the geographical element, it's got the specific type of activity and even intention. That's how much detail you have to use to describe individuals. And for every type of behavior that you want to stop them from doing, often you will see them listed as separate defendants. So separate defendant four might be persons unknown entering or remaining on X land. Person, um, defendant five, persons unknown, blocking any part of the bellman at the site entrance, etc., etc. That's often how it's done to prevent you having a huge block of wording just for one person's unknown defendant. And what you end, end up finding is that the wording used to define persons unknown in the claim form, particulars, etc., is basically the same as the wording that you will put in the draft order, i.e., the wording of the injunction. But I'll deal with order wording, the draft order wording later on. A further twist in the story. So the Court of Appeal in Canada Goose has added a further restriction to this type of proceeding and relief. A final injunction granted against persons unknown, unknown will not apply to those individuals unless they have committed one of the prohibited acts before the final injunction and, and they have subsequently been served with the claim form. So the interim injunction stage, you can it would, that will apply, uh, the interim injunction will apply to newcomers, people who before the interim injunction was granted 
had never protested there before. But once a final injunction is granted, the category of people it, it counts against is closed. Presumably you'll have to start proceedings against those people in a new claim. And that was applied, and I should say, and that was the first time that I'd ever seen that. And so it was completely new. And it was applied for the first time by the High Court in Apsar um, and summarised quite neatly there by Mr Justice Warby. So unknown persons in protest can only be subject to a final injunction if the person is unknown is described sufficiently, they fell within that description or came within it later, but before the final injunction, i.e. they had been there and protested, perhaps they'd been caught on camera or something, even if you don't know what their name is. They had then been served with the proceedings and obviously it's impossible or impractical to identify them. So um, much harder now to go against. It. So you do have a very mobile group of protesters. Take, for example, Extinction Rebellion or the Sheffield Tree protesters. You have a huge group of people willing to protest who are interchanging, um, provides more difficulties for that scenario now. Moving then on to service service of the claim form, accompanying documents such as witness statements, particulars, etc. This tripped up the claimant in Canada Goose, so do be wary of it. It's not a foregone conclusion, particularly applicable when going against persons unknown, which I said will often be often be the case in protest cases, but applies to name defence as well. For, un, for persons unknown, you have to apply for an order for service by an alternative method. You can't serve it at the address of the person's unknown because you don't know where they live. So you, you have to apply for it to have it served alternatively at a prominent place, and that will often be at the place of the protest, on a post, around the locate, around the circumference, etc. And you make this application when filing the claim. You get and get a hearing very shortly after you claim is filed and issued with a master, High Court master, um, so that you can then serve all the documents on the named and non-named defendants at the same time. Again, it looks straightforward, but was fatal in Canada Goose, so do be wary of that. Moving then finally onto the draft order, another very tricky issue, what should you actually injunct? Some basic principles to still in Canada Goose, these have been refined and even completely changed between Ineos, Quadrilla, Canada Goose. So in Canada Goose, Lord Justice Leggett looked at, um, well, so the first is that the wording of the injunction has to refer to acts which correspond to the tort. So if you are unhappy about trespass, the wording has to be relate to, um, it's prohibited from remaining, entering or remaining without consent on this land. Um, it may include lawful activity, but only if there are no other proportionate means of protecting claimants' rights. And we'll look into that in more detail in a moment. A big, a big important point is the sufficiently clear and precise wording of the draft order. And in Canada Goose, Lord Justice Leggett looked at three types of uncertainty. The first type of uncertainty is where terms are ambiguous, i.e. where they have more than one meaning. The second type is where terms are vague, i.e. there will be borderline cases to which it, it is inherently uncertain whether the term applies. So terms such as unreasonably, unreasonable, vague, terms such as a short distance, vague, because you're not sure where the borderline is. And then the third type of um, imprecision is where terms are too, un are too convoluted, technical, or require legal knowledge. So, for example, you can't just put the wording is prohibited from trespassing on next land or prohibited from um, being responsible for a nuisance. You have to spell out the exact conduct. As the law study, clear geographical limits and clear temporal limits to the injunction. And then very briefly, just looking at two examples, one which is unacceptable and one which was acceptable. Quadrilla example, this is one of an acceptable example of the draft order. You can see that it's geographically specific, referring to the site entrance, it refers to intention, which the court in that example said was okay. Um, and you'll see they're all tied to the tort of nuisance, blocking or obstructing passage to the highway. There is a reference to slow walking, but I think the court found that acceptable because it was tied with intention. Uh, and then finally, looking at Canada Goose, this is an example of one that was unacceptable. Um, the acts sought to be prohibited were not confined to unlawful acts. For example, projecting images on the outside of the store, intentionally photographing certain persons. I think this falls into the category of what Dave was talking about, which is when people just try and go too far. 
Um, and not on the slide, but in INEOS, also the wording wasn't um, specifically clear enough. References to slow walking were too imprecise, likewise with references to unreasonably obstructing the highway and references to obstructing the highway without reasonable excuse. Those words were too, the third type of, of clarity and precision that Lord Justice Lego were talking about, which was their too opaque. So that was a, a rush through of some of the procedure involving protesters, the process injunctions. Now, delighted to hand over to Richard Langham. Troll. Richard, you need and to... I'm assuming I can be heard. You can now, yes, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you and good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Richard Langham and I'm talking about uh, the South Bromley case. Um, and in particular, the spate of borough-wide injunctions designed to prevent use of public land by travellers, which culminated in the recent Court of Appeal decision in South Bromley, a decision which rather suggests that there aren't going to be any more such injunctions in the future. I'm going to start with some background, both in relation to injunctions and the position of gypsies and travellers. In relation to injunctions, uh, it's been accepted since the mid-2000s that it's possible to make injunctions against persons unknown. And in the areas of law we're concerned with, injunctions to prevent persons unknown from breaching planning control in relation to particular sites are common. In the case of Mayer in 2009, it was held that in relation to a threatened trespass, the appropriate remedy was an injunction rather than a possession order, and that such an injunction also could be made against persons unknown, although that was in relation, again, to a small number of particular sites. In relation to injunctions to restrain breaches of planning control, the idea of a borough-wide injunction has been accepted since the 1990s, uh, but the early borough-wide planning injunctions were in relation to named defendants on the basis that those individuals had a track record of carrying out particular breaches and were virtually certain to do so again, but the authority couldn't tell where. Background in relation to uh, gypsies and travellers, as many of you will know, the legal and planning policy definition of gypsies and travellers requires a nomadic habit of life, uh, that is travelling for the purposes of making a living. The Court of Appeal in Bromley accepted that the ability to travel and to stop on land while travelling was an integral part of the gypsy way of life and is protected by Article 8. As many of you will also know, uh, there has been a significant number of planning permissions granted in recent years for settled bases for travellers, often on appeal, but there hasn't been equivalent new provision in relation to transit sites, that is sites that can be used for short periods when travellers are travelling. One of the points made in Bromley by the Court of Appeal is that there are no transit sites at all in Greater London, and the closest transit site to Bromley is the site in South Mims in Hertfordshire. Uh, one consequence of the lack of transit sites is that quite a lot of travelling involves trespass, usually on public land such as car parks and other parks. Uh, and many authorities have regular incursions and find themselves having to take repeated action to evict travellers. As a consequence, for many years there has been government guidance to local authorities dealing with such, dealing with such unauthorised encampment, which bluntly accepts that there are situations where trespass should be tolerated. I don't seem to have control of the slides. <clears throat> Thank you. And so I turn to the kind of injunctions that were considered in Bromley. Starting in about 2015, boroughs and districts began to obtain injunctions against persons unknown to prevent encampment on any public land within the authority's area. The injunctions technically related to specific pieces of land, but were usually all the car parks and other open spaces owned by the authority 
and invariably ran into the hundreds. The purpose, frankly, was to prevent any visitation by groups of travellers to the borough. The evidence in support usually showed that there'd been a pattern of regular trespassery encampment by travellers on open space in the past, uh, that conventional enforcement measures uh, always took time, and that while the trespass continued, there was often fly tipping, which had to be cleared at the public expense. And if someone is controlling the slides, I'd like the next one, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, the injunctions themselves usually took the same form. They prohibited setting up an encampment on one of the identified sites without the written permission of the local authority or the grant of plan permission by an inspector, entering the sites for residential purposes, putting caravans on the sites, depositing waste on the identified sites without a license or an environmental permit. Uh, you can see that the injunctions that were sought appear to assume that trespass would involve a breach of planning control and the authorities invariably relied on 187B of the Town and Country Planning Act. It is quite true that planning recognises the concept of a temporary use. Indeed, there is a permitted development right to use any land for the stationing of one caravan for one or two nights, and a more extensive PD right in relation to large sites. But if the act of a trespasser for one night really amounts to a material change for planning purposes, Presumably, it breaks the continuity of the previous use by the landowner for immunity purposes, which strikes me as very surprising. How it is that the act of a trespasser amounts to development has never really been considered so far as I'm aware. Uh, it appears to have been floated in Bromley without being answered. Now, can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. <clears throat> In terms of procedure, the authority invariably made a without notice application for an injunction with provisions for substituted service uh, and with a fixed return date in about three months time. The authority would get its without notice injunction and on the return date would ask for what it called a final order. Until Bromley, no one contested the grant of the so-called final order and final orders were always granted. The final orders were invariably time limited, the period usually being about three years. And it's relevant to note, therefore, that most of the existing orders are about to switch off if they haven't done so already. Uh, I would also observe uh, that uh, the provisions for service that were originally um, uh, secured by the claimant authorities wouldn't satisfy the uh, requirements that we now understand from Quadrilla and Cameron. And also uh, the, the, the so-called injunctions, sorry, the so-called final injunctions are not final injunctions within the meaning of canon of use. Uh, if we can have the next slide, please. Uh, several of the judgments on the return days were reported, and I give the references there. Um, in fact, the Court of Appeal tells us that there were a total of 38 such injunctions with a high concentration in and around Greater London. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. And so I come to the Bromley case. Uh, this started in the normal way. On the return day, the judge made a wide injunction in relation to fly tipping and waste, but didn't make, in, make an injunction against anything else. It appears that the judge was unclear as to whether unauthorized encampment would always be in breach of planning control. However, she found that the requirements for an interim injunction to restrain trespass had been satisfied, i.e. there was a strong probability that trespass would occur and if it did, the damages would not be an adequate remedy. Uh, she nevertheless held that an injunction would be disproportionate and as a result, exercised her discretion not to grant it. This meant that the council's appeal to the Court of Appeal had to be against the exercise of her discretion, which inevitably meant that it was facing quite an uphill struggle when it got to the Court of Appeal. Uh, the factors relied on by the judge in the exercise of her discretion were identified by the Court of Appeal as listed on the screen, uh, essentially, the injunction was too wide because its effect was to ban any encampment in the borough. It was not aimed specifically at prohibiting antisocial or criminal behaviour. There were no transit sites at all in Greater London. Injunctions like this would have a cumulative effect. There had been no equality impact assessment or consideration of Article 8, the best interests of children or the public sector equality duty. 
Can we have the next slide, please? Uh, the judgment of the Court of Appeal was delivered by Lord Justice Coulson. He rejected the criticism of the judge and made it clear that essentially he agreed with her. He proceeded to give guidance on how the court should approach the grant of such injunctions in the future in paragraph 108. That you have on the screen and I'm going to read it. When injunction orders are sought against the gypsy and traveller community, the evidence should include what other suitable and secure alternative housing or transit sites are reasonably available. This is necessary if the nomadic lifestyle of the gypsy and traveller community is to have effective protection under Article 8 and the Equality Act. If there is no alternative or transit site, no proposal for such a site, and no support for the provision of such a site, then that may weigh significantly against the proportionality of any order. The submission that the gypsy and traveller community can go elsewhere or occupy private land is not a sufficient response, particularly when an injunction is imposed in circumstances where multiple nearby authorities are taking similar action. There should be a proper engagement with the gypsy and traveller community and an assessment of the impact that an injunction might have, taking into account their specific needs, vulnerabilities and different lifestyle. To this end, the carrying out of a substantive EIA, so far as the needs of the effective community can be identified, should be considered good practice. And then finally, special consideration is to be given to the timing and manner of approaches to dealing with any unlawful settlement and as regards the arrangements for, uh, for alternative pitches or housing. I have to say I don't quite understand how that last requirement operates, but I think it is perfectly clear how the previous uh, uh, requirements are intended to operate. Um, the judge went on to say at paragraph 109 that an injunction which prevents gypsies and travellers from stopping at all in a defined part of the UK would comprise a potential breach of both the Convention and the Equality Act, and had earlier said that there is an inescapable tension between the Article 8 rights of the gypsy and traveller community and the common law of trespass. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And, and so I finish with some thoughts on where we now are. Uh, I think the most obvious thought uh, is that we are unlikely to see any more such injunctions given the test that has been suggested. Uh, and as I've mentioned, many of the existing injunctions are about to switch off. I suppose there might be some scope for more limited injunctions, that is relating to only some of the authorities over the space. But you might think that such an injunction would be an open invitation to occupy the non-injunctive open space. It is obviously right that transit sites would be a solution. But if a location has a proper supply of these, there would probably be no need for an injunction in the first place. I am not sure how the authority is going to rely on a site where trespass is merely tolerated. I'm not sure what form of engagement with the traveller community is contemplated. The target is essentially large groups. You might be able to find such a group, but engaging with it might be difficult. It presumably won't be in the authority's area at the relevant time, and the whole point about an injunction against persons unknown is that the claimant can't identify the people it's directed at. EIA is, of course, a different matter. That's something the authority does for itself. Finally, I pose the question how the tension between the law of trespass and the traveller's rights under Article 8 to be resolved. If we assume the likely situation where there, is no, there are no transit sites, no borough-wide injunction, and a group of travellers turn up on public land, is the council going to be able to get a possession order? The extent to which the Article 8, sorry, the extent to which the Article 8 right to respect for a home can be relied on to defeat a possession order is the matter decided in Pinnock and is very limited. Travellers in our situation won't be saying that the open space is their home, but that Article 8 includes a right to stop for the purpose of travelling. And remember that Article 8 protects private and family life and is not specifically confined to homes at all. So, is there going to be a defence to a possession order? If not, is the authority going to find itself chasing a group of travellers around its borough with a series of possession orders? which was exactly the, the reason why the Supreme Court in Mayer said that injunctions to prevent threatened trespass against vulnerable sites were a good idea in the first place. Uh, can we have the next and final slide, please? Thank you. I've, uh, I've been asked to say something about the powers of local authorities during the present pandemic. 
And the position is as follows. Possession proceedings under part 55 can still be started, but with one important exception, are stayed until the 30th of October. The exception is possession actions against trespassers under Rule 55 and 6. Also, the stay does not apply to actions for an injunction. These, of course, are not possession actions at all. Now, Rule 55 6 deals with possession orders against unknown trespass, trespassers. In fact, it merely deals with service of the claim form on unknown trespassers. And you might think that reference to that rule was an odd way of carving out an exception. The consequence, presumably, is that a possession order, I'm sorry, a possession action against a known trespasser will be stayed. I have no idea what the position is supposed to be if the landowner knows about some of the trespassers and not others. Possession orders, of course, operate in REM. You can't have a possession order that is directed at some of the occupiers of your land, but not others. A landowner can still seek an injunction, but that will only be appropriate against a threatened trespass. A landowner cannot circumvent the, pro the protections of the possession order procedure by seeking an injunction against actual trespassers, i.e. against people who are actually on his land already. Finally, local authorities can still, in theory, make removal directions and seek removal orders under the 1994 Criminal Justice and Public Order Act. But if the local magistrate's court is closed, as many are, the authority won't be getting any uh, uh, removal orders made by the court. Uh, so that concludes what uh, uh, I had uh, wished to say. I now move on, I now pass the baton to Matthew Fraser, who is going to deal with uh, the proposals to extend police powers against unauthorized encampment. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, so we're running a bit behind, so I'm going to try and canter through this reasonably quickly. Um, this, this talk is all about the government's recent consultation proposals to extend police powers in relation to unauthorised encampments. Um, before we get into the detail, um, just a quick recap on the law of trespass. Trespass is a, is a civil wrong, um, and it's not generally considered to be a criminal offence. Um, there are, however, a lot of criminal offences which have been created by statute which involve trespass. Um, so if you see signs, for example, on fields that say trespassers will be prosecuted, generally that's not possible, um, but there are obvious um, uh, exceptions to that. Um, in terms of criminal offences that do involve trespass, some of the common ones are trespass on land with a gun, um, squatting in residential premises is now is fairly recently become a criminal offence. Um, trespass on protected sites, so for example if you're walking along the Chilterns Way and you see the Chequers estate next to you, you'll probably see a sign saying this site is a protected site under the Serious Organised Crime and Police Act 2005 and the mere trespassing on that site, knowing that it to be a protected site is um, a criminal offence. Um, and then failing to comply with a police direction to leave land in the case of an unauthorised encampment, we'll be looking at that in more detail in due course. And I think my favourite trespass related um, criminal offence um, relates to the failure to comply with the direction to leave a rave. And this really is um, a, a wonderful example of the finest traditions of parliamentary drafting. Um, the legislation um, valiantly def defines what a rave is, it says it's a gathering on land in the open air of a hundred or more persons at which amplified music is played during the night with or without intermissions and is such as by reason of its loudness and duration and the time at which it is played is likely to cause serious distress to the inhabitants of the locality. And then even more ambitiously, the legislation attempts to define what music is, and it defines it as sounds wholly or predominantly characterized by the emission of a succession of repetitive beats. I just love the, the image of the police turning up at a rave and having a debate with the organizers about whether the music falls into that definition. Moving now to the current position on unauthorized encampments. Um, so trespass for the purpose of setting up an, un un an unauthorized encampment is not of itself an offense at the moment. It is only an offense if all of the following ingredients are present. Firstly, you have to have two or more persons trespass on the land. 
They need to have a common purpose of residing there for any period. In addition, reasonable steps need to have been taken by or on behalf of the occupier to ask them to leave. And either you have a situation where the person has caused damage or is being abusive, or alternatively, you have six or more vehicles on the land. Um, and then lastly, but most importantly, the police need to have actually directed the trespassers to leave the land, um, but they knowingly haven't done so. And it's only at that point that the criminal offence crystallises. Um, and that, that takes us neatly on to what the consultation on proposed changes are. There are two alternatives which have recently been consulted upon. The first is the more radical um, proposal, which is to criminalise unauthorised encampments themselves. And the second alternative, um, more mild reform, would be to amend the existing powers to strengthen what the police can do and when. Starting with the more radical alternative, the, the criminalising of unauthorised encampments themselves. Um, this proposal is said to be based on examples from Ireland and Scotland. Um, and what's the basis? Why would, why would we need this more radical reform? Well, it's said by the proposals to act as a deterrent to future encampments. It makes enforcement easier, reduces the costs of dealing with eviction and clean up. Um, there's a lot of debate within the consultation proposals about what what precisely would the ingredients of the offence actually be? Um, for example, would you need to demonstrate actual or likely future damage? Um, is there a requirement um, on the landowner to take reasonable steps um, to ask the trespasser to leave? Um, should there be um, some requirement that the encampment is preventing the lawful use of the land by the lawful occupier? Um, does there need to be a demand for money by the trespassers in return to departure in order for there to be an offence? Um, should there be an antisocial behaviour element that's a necessary ingredient? So a lot of debate about quite how this criminal offence would be formulated. It's very unclear which way the government's going to go on that one. Um, the, the minor, the, the more mild alternative, um, less radical, rather than creating a criminal offence itself would be to just strengthen the powers somewhat. So at the moment um, it's, it's an offence to return to a site three months after you've been asked to leave by the police. The, the proposal is to extend this to 12 months. Um, there's another proposal to reduce the threshold from six or more vehicles to two or more vehicles before um, you can direct people to leave. Um, there's a proposal to expand it to highway land. Um, rather than private land. Um, and finally, there's a proposal on foot to um, allow the police to direct trespassers, not just to the same local authority area, but also to widen this to neighbouring local authority areas. Um, and, and so that's the, that's the position in relation to the milder element. Some of the issues arising are, um, a lot of authorities have said, well, we need to have agreements in place about directing to neighbouring sites because we don't want people to just um, be disincentivized from providing sites to their own um, authority because they'll have this power to get the, uh, get the trespassers directed to an alternative site. Uh, is there, there's also a question mark about whether there should be a maximum distance for travel. The consultation responses, as you can imagine, are fairly mixed. Uh, there are a huge number out there, but I've just picked two opposing um, viewpoints. One is from the local government association, fully in support of the strength and powers, but their position is that it needs to be done in conjunction with providing more financial support, both to local authorities and to the police, and also just to provide support to provide more transit sites. Um, there's a recognised shortage of them, um, and that's something that Richard was speaking about earlier. Um, there's also um, a concern that the local government association has about reforming the court process to make obtaining injunctions easier. And I think there's always a tension between bringing a private action in court um, versus relying on statutory police powers. And I think ideally, if the police powers were functioning as they should do, there shouldn't necessarily be any need for the court process um, for individuals to actually um, bring their own private actions for injunctions. And the other thing that the LGA are very keen on doing is strengthening a collaborative approach with the, with the traveller community. It's like coming at, from a complete different angle, the Friends, Families and Travellers Association, um, they're opposed to strength and powers um, and uh, they think that actually there should be a move away from punishment and criminalisation and, and a focus more on improved site provision, um, strengthening duties on authorities, on the police, um, improving funding. And they say that actually they've consulted with uh, 
lots of police forces and the police are uh, by and large in, in favor of that as well they don't want to see expanded powers apparently so where are we in terms of conclusions we will obviously just have to wait and see what the government say in response um, there's absolutely no consensus at the moment on whether the extended powers are desirable but there is in my view a consensus that there needs to be a, a coordinated approach um, with a lot more funding provided to local authorities and the police not just for dealing with unauthorized encampments but actually more proactively and constructively providing um, altern alternative transit sites i think there's a there's a real tension it's one of the things that richard was talking about in relation to the the bromley case is a there's a real tension between on the one hand um balancing the power of the lawful occupier um, of, of a site um, to, to remove people who um, are using it in a damaging way versus the legitimate needs of those whose needs can't be met um, on existing sites and um, how do you deal with that and it's only a minority of the traveller community who, who currently reside um, on author unauthorised sites it's thought to be somewhere in the region of four or five percent so we're, talk we're very much talking about a minority situation here um, but as I say if, if the police powers can be moved can become more effectively utilized and implemented by the police then it should obviate the need um, to rely on um, costly and, um, and, and, and slow moving court processes. So I hope that's been a useful quick canter through the uh, consultation responses and I, I'll now hand back to our chair David Forsdick QC to conduct the Q&A session. Thanks. Thank you very much Matthew and thank you to all the speakers and also thank you for the questions that have been coming through. I, I may have to go off to court to get an injunction because as we've been speaking, the council has come along and started digging up the road outside my house. So apologies if you can't um, hear me. Um, I, I hope it's not too bad. We've got a number of questions um, that have been raised um, and I hope the panel has had a chance to look at the questions as, as they've been coming in. Yes, yeah, so there's, there's one from James who asked about the position um, in terms of persons unknown. Um, and uh, the situation where they haven't protested prior to the final injunction, but they're within the categories covered by the final injunction, would they be banned? Uh, my own understanding of um, uh, Canada Goose is that they wouldn't be banned because they, they're newcomers. Is that, is that right? Yeah, I agree. So you look at paragraph 89 of Canada Goose, Court of Appeal, um, and it says in terms a final injunction cannot be granted in a protester case against persons unknown who are not parties at the date of the final order that is to say newcomers who have not by that time committed the prohibited acts and so do not fall within the description of the persons unknown and who have not been served with the claim form so yeah you're right those people would not okay. be would not be caught for those people you'd have to i think tim mentioned this you'd have to go back for another injunction against a new cohort of persons unknown but who are now identifiable by a photo or whatever and getting yeah. running against them yeah. Uh, Tim, a, a question has been raised by Katie at Friends of the Earth about the Quadrilla case and the um, uh, uh, the position, the, the level of conduct that can be injunctable. And she she raises a point, quite uh, quite clear point about um, you said you had to have a unlawful act in order to found a claim for an injunction. And she points out quite rightly that in Quadrilla, some non unlawful acts were within the ambit of the final injunction. How, how do you square that circle? Well, I think I, yes, we. I saw that question and Yasser and I have just had a brief debate about it, so Yasser can come in if he thinks I've got it wrong, but I think the point is that the starting point that I identified is still correct. You, you have to, and, and it's kind of fundamental to the whole approach, think back to that Professor Dicey quote, you have to identify some unlawful action which founds your right to seek an injunction and which founds the ability of the court to restrain, uh, restrain what the protesters are doing. What I think is being said in, first of all, um, the Quadrilla case, and then subsequently it's developed actually in the Canada Goose case, and Yasser picked up on this, is that the court doesn't have an absolute rule, although it certainly still has a kind of, I think it still treats this as quite a powerful preference, that the injunction will not be granted in terms which restrain lawful activity. But I don't think that's going against the idea you have to have a cause of action and demonstrate that what's going on is unlawful. I think it's reflecting one and maybe two things. The first is that I think the court is recognising that in practice there may be situations where it's, it's really difficult to, to frame your injunction in a way that doesn't, that perfectly matches up to the, um, the what would be unlawful under the relevant cause of action. And so the possibility that you may accidentally capture something that would be lawful 
may be a price to pay for vindicating the claimant's rights. And secondly, and I think this is going to be more controversial, but I think this may be contemplated by the court, there may be situations in where in order to prevent in future the breach of something that it would be unlawful, it may be, lim it may be, necess it may be thought necessary, even if you could precisely frame the injunction without this, to, re 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 uh, to restrain something that is lawful. For example, something that will be lawful in itself, which would be preliminary to doing something unlawful. So you may want, you may be able to have, and I think this is quite controversial and I don't think it's straightforward from Canada Youth, you may be able to have a situation where you'd have an injunction which would stop people going to a location with a view to carrying out something unlawful. That's how I understand it. If you have to think so. Richard, can you come in there? Yeah, yes, um, I had read what he said in Quadrilla as covering the kind of situa situation that you often get with planning injunctions. Uh, you can obviously it is obviously unlawful to lay hard standing without planning permission, um, but the injunction will often also cover bringing materials yeah. onto the site. It is itself perfectly lawful, but is regarded as being something that uh, um, clearly could be ancillary to the laying of hard standing. Yeah, um, that. Th th those provisions are quite common, although uh, uh, their basis wasn't really discussed before what we see in Quadrilla, but one would hope in the future that that would be the, the, the argument that you could use to justify yeah. those. But in Canada Goose, it was very, a very clear line was drawn between the actions of lawful public protests, which couldn't be injuncted, yeah. uh, and, and ones that went the wrong side of the line. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, just, I just think it's worth re-emphasising, you know, the court is not saying we will routinely grant injunctions against things which are lawful, it's saying it's not an absolute role, rule that we will not do that if there are good reasons to do it, but it's not going to be the, the, the norm. But Richard, a number of questions have come in about the stay on possession proceedings and what local authorities are to do and in terms of um, yes. injunctions and uh, in terms of persons unknown and so on. I think the short question yes. with the local authority listeners here is what on earth are they to do now um, in, in the light of all this case law? Um, in, the, in the light of the person's unknown case, or in the light of uh, 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 Canada Goose, and of course in the light of Bromley, it looks like they're in a rather uh, impossible... They are. Yes, yes. I mean, in, in light of um, Bromley, the scope, the scope for an injunction is going to be... And the question is, is whether there's any point in seeking an injunction that's only going to protect uh, uh, some only of the open spaces in an authority's area. Now, yeah, I suppose one can envision situations where there are particular um, car parks or playing fields that are uh, um, that have been used in the past, and that there's a particular reason to protect those. And Bromley doesn't prevent; um, it doesn't deal with uh, the propriety of an injunction of that kind. But uh, I mean, I can say from experience that those sort of injunctions are quite rare. It's it's um, uh, authorities, in fact, didn't really use injunctions uh, until they discovered that it was possible to protect all the open spaces in their area. And so, uh, so my, which my, that could be very much more difficult. Yeah, my was, then, but, to address, my was designed to address that particular issue of what used to be called, I think, when I was very junior, a cat and mouse game around a local authority's area. Yes, that's right. Uh, yes, and yes. and mm -hmm. the case of now has come full circle, effectively. Yes. Local yes. Authorities are because May was, May was much more straight. Well, it wasn't really necessary to worry about the problem of trouble the Court of Appeal, because that was just the Forest Commission, the Forestry Commission's forests. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and so then in relation to possession proceedings, the only alternative is possession proceedings, and the position is as I've outlined it. Okay. With, with, a, with a very big question mark over what potentially is the um, most likely form of possession order. Indeed, you might think gypsies would be well advised to some of them to come and introduce themselves to the council so that at least some of the trespassers are known. There's been one question raised about um, patients refusing to leave hospital and whether injunctions can be obtained against them. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that's really within the ambit of this talk, but if anyone wants to address that, then... Does anyone have an answer to that one? 
Um, I know that there was a case about it last week, but I confess that I don't, I haven't. Okay. So, sorry, we can't um, uh, answer your question, Julian, in any detail. Apologies for that. But I think that brings us to the end of our time and to the end of our, um, I'm told it was UCH and MB. So thank you very much, Julian. Thank you. Um, uh, if um, Thank you very much for coming on, on to this um, seminar. I hope you found it useful. Um, uh, thank you to the speakers uh, and um, keep, keep safe. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.